when I was preparing to come here and I got a text from Dr. Aiken saying, don't forget to bring your gown. I can assure you that was the first time I'd ever received that text when preparing to go preach somewhere. So only for Dr. Aiken. Uh, it really is an honor to be back here. I just, I'm just standing up here as we're singing, just overwhelmed by God's grace. Um, I should be in hell right now, and I'm like standing with brothers and sisters, worshiping Jesus, our King, uh, having received like an education in His Word and how to do ministry in the church under professors like Jim Shaddix, who's down here. Like, God is so gracious to us in this room. So. If you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does, look, you can look on with. Let me invite you to open with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I know that it has been Dr. Aiken's pattern in fall convocation to wed exposition of a text with the story of a missionary's life. I've benefited from those messages, both in audio and, and written form. So as I was praying about where to go this morning in God's word, I, th I thought to do something similar, but not with a missionary's life. I resumed recently from a trip to South Korea, and I'd been there before, but God did an unusual, unexpected work in my heart during my time there, challenging, encouraging, convicting me in ways that I didn't see coming. So I would like to wed exposition of John 12, 24 through 26 with the story of the church in South Korea, I hope in a way that highlights the truth in this text in God's word. So let me start by giving you a little background on the church in Korea with an emphasis particularly on the last century. So Christian teaching goes all the way back to the early 1600s. But it was more the Catholic Church. Uh, gospel Protestant teaching was scarce until the late 19th century. Robert Thomas was a missionary to China, but God gave him a heart for Korea. Foreigners were not welcome in Korea at that point. On his second attempt to get there by boat, he took a case of Bibles with him. His boat was attacked when they got to the shore. So he just started throwing Bibles overboard, yelling, Jesus, Jesus, until he was seized and killed. But in 1884, the few Christians in Korea received official permission from the government to spread their religion, which then opened the doors for missionaries to come in and support them. And by the turn of the century in 1900, less than 1% of the Korean population was Christian, but there was opportunity to grow. And that began to happen in what would become known in Korean history as the Pyongyang Revival of 1907, what many people have called the Korean Pentecost. January 1907, there was a large Bible conference held with about 1,500 Christian leaders. That's a lot for the state of Christianity in the country at that time. It included Koreans, included missionaries from other countries in Pyongyang, what is now the capital of North Korea. In anticipation of that meeting, many of them were pleading before God. The country was struggling. The church was struggling. They were desperate. And during the meeting, the preachers, both missionaries and Korean pastors, as they preached, became personally overwhelmed by their own sin and need for repentance in their own lives. They started confessing their sin publicly, including hidden sin before God, before others, even bitterness they had held toward others in the church. Their confession led others in the audience to begin to do the same. People started standing up just in a gathering like this, spontaneously confessing their sin, crying out for God's mercy, many of them praying at the same time. Here's how one pastor described that first night. He said, the sound of many praying at once brought not confusion, 
but a vast harmony of sound and spirit, a mingling together of souls moved by an irresistible impulse of prayer. The prayer sounded to me like the falling of many waters, an ocean of prayer beating against God's throne. Just as on the day of Pentecost, God came to us in Pyongyang that night with the sound of weeping. As the prayer continued, a spirit of heaviness and sorrow for sin came down upon the audience. Over on one side, someone began to weep. In a moment, the whole audience was weeping. He continued, man after man would rise, confess his sins, break down and weep, then throw himself to the floor and beat the floor with his fists in perfect agony of conviction. One man tried to make a confession, broke down in the midst of it and cried to me across the room, pastor, tell me, is there any hope for me? Can I be forgiven? And then he threw himself to the floor and wept and wept and almost screamed in agony. Sometimes after a confession, the whole audience would break out an audible prayer. And the effect of that audience of hundreds of people praying together an audible prayer was something indescribable. Again, after another confession, they would break out in uncontrollable weeping. We would all weep. We could not help it. And so the meeting went on until 2 o'clock a.m. like this with confession and weeping and praying. What happened that night continued the next day and the next. And the marks of Korean revival were born study of God's Word, confession of sin, collective, audible, praying and crying out for God's mercy. And in the days to come, that movement of God's Spirit spread into village after village and church after church. People started coming to Christ left and right. Churches were being planted. Christians were praying early together every morning. They would gather for all night prayer gatherings. Northern Korea specifically was becoming a stronghold of Protestant Christianity in Asia and Pyongyang. So the current capital of North Korea became known as the Jerusalem of the East. It was affecting the entire culture. Christians were starting hospitals and schools. Union Christian College in Pyongyang was the first four-year college in Korea. In the middle of it all, though, the country was experiencing all, all sorts of turmoil, trial, trial first from Japanese occupation and then war that eventually led to the division of the country and the implementation of communism in the North. I'll tell you more in a minute about the effect of Japanese occupation and communism on the church, but many Christians fled to the South, where today, so get this, in 1900, Korea was less than 1% Christian. Christianity practically non-existent. A century later, in South Korea, there were over 10 million followers of Jesus. 10 million. And the church I was preaching in recently has over 60,000 members. It's a large church. And it's one of many churches like that. It's not the biggest one. Like our mega churches are many, many churches. And and so South Korea is second right now only to the U.S. in number of missionaries being sent around the world, which is pretty startling when you realize its population is only the size of California and Florida combined. In one century, South Korea went from having hardly any Christians to being a global center of Christianity. How does that happen? John 12, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. According to Jesus, what is the key to a seed bearing fruit? It has to die. Hold a grain of wheat in your hand. Keep it there. It won't do anything. You plant it in the ground and it dies. It bears all kinds of life that you could have never imagined before. Jesus says, in order to live, you have to die. Period. Death is necessary for life. Now, the context here is Jesus is about to go to the cross. Jesus is literally, physically about to die. And he's talking about the life he's going to bring to others through his death. This is the gospel at the center of our faith, our lives in this room even. You know, on a seminary campus, I don't assume 
everyone in a room this size is a follower of Jesus, so let me just make sure the core message of the Bible is clear. We have all sinned against the one true holy God. We are separated from him in our sin and destined to be separated from him for all of eternity in our sin as a result. Yet the one true holy God loves us and has not left us alone in our sin. He has come to us in the person of Jesus. Jesus has lived the life none of us could ever live, a life of no sin against God the Father. And then, though he had no sin for which to die, he chose to die in our place. He lived the life we could not live, and he died the death we deserve to die. And then the good news keeps getting better because he didn't stay dead for long. Three days later, he rose from the grave. He has conquered sin and death, and he has made eternal life possible to anyone, anywhere who turns and trusts in him, who repents and believes in him. Like, don't assume just because you got enrolled that your name is written in the book of life. Have you turned and put your trust in Jesus Christ? Jesus died so we might live. This is the gospel that brings us together. The reality that death precedes life. But now follow this. In this passage, Jesus is not just talking about what he was going to do in the cross. He is talking about every follower of his. Listen to what he says next in verse 25. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So Jesus is clearly here not just talking about his death. He is also talking about our lives. Jesus is saying to us in this passage, like right now through his word in this room, if you want to live, you have to die. You have to die. That's what Jesus means when he says hating your life in this world. And note how he says in this world. We'll talk about this more in a minute, but Jesus is not saying to hate life ultimately. He's saying to hate life that is caught up in rebellion against God and his word and his ways. Don't love life like that. Die to life like that. Which is what Jesus says to every potential follower of his. Think Luke 9, 23, 24. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, an instrument of death, daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So this is not advanced Christianity. This is basic Christianity. This is not for the mature. This is introduction to following Jesus. In order to become a Christian, you must die. Galatians 2.20 is the testimony of every follower of Jesus. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ now lives in me. I don't live anymore. I died with Christ. He now lives in me. Jesus is my life. To live in the next world, you die to this world. And you bear fruit that lasts when you lay down your life. Now, the reason I go to this text is because I believe this is what happened in Korea. And when I read about, hear stories recently about revival in Korea, it wasn't like they discovered something new in the Bible. No, they realized in a fresh way that death precedes life. That in order to live, you have to die. And in at least three ways that I see, both in Scripture and in Korean history. They're pretty simple, but all of them hugely significant. So number one, in order to live, in order to live, you have to die to sin. In order to live like real, eternal life, you have to die to sin. Life in this world, set up against God and his word and his ways, Jesus says. Which obviously doesn't mean you don't ever sin. I just finished preaching through 1 John where it's clear that as long as we are in this world, we are prone to sin. But that's just it. We hate that. We hate that we are prone to sin. We don't want to sin And when we do, we confess it before God and others. And we repent. We turn from it. We don't toy with it. We don't treat sin as trivial. That's what happened in 1907 at Pyongyang. God, by his grace, opened their eyes to see their sin, and they hated it. Church leaders, pastors, missionaries confessing their sinfulness. 
spontaneously, people crying out for forgiveness with tears, weeping, falling on the floor. They hated their sin. They were tired of glossing over it. Don't miss it. Revival in South Korea didn't happen when all these people in the country started getting right with God. It started happening when the pastors started getting right with God. When the missionaries started being honest about sin in their lives. And I can't help but think that we are missing this. I, I look at the church in our country today, and not just generally, I look at the church I pastor, and I don't see this kind of hatred for sin. I don't see it in my own life like I want to see it. Like a hatred of sin, such that when we gather for worship, we weep over our sin. When was the last time that happened in your church on a Sunday morning? When has that happened for many of us ever in the church? Many of us have been for Christians for decades, and we have never been in a church setting where people were on their faces weeping over sin, crying out an honest confession. Do we realize what kind of church culture we have created, where we, pastors and members, attenders alike, have grown pretty content to go week after week in church, watch what happens on a stage, and then go on in our lives as normal? Or to do the same thing in chapel, for that matter. What would happen if at some point we just stopped and said, what are we doing? All across a room like this, we just started crying out in confession of sin, uncovering hidden sin, confessing we sin, sin we even harbored toward others. Pride. And what would happen in this gathering if we started confessing sin like they did in Pyongyang? All across this room, like hating it, bringing it into the open, crying out for mercy, falling on our faces before the holiness of God. Like, why does that seem like unusual for us? Like, where are the Ezra's in ministry, the Ezra's in our churches who rise before God and fall to their knees with faces on the floor, hands spread out, saying, I'm too ashamed, disgraced to lift my face when I see my sin and the sin of your people. Like, what will it take to bring us to that point? And I hesitate in one sense to even ask the question because uh, it's not something we can like, manufacture, right? It's something only the Spirit of God can make happen in hearts. Which leads to the second death I see in the story of Korean Christianity and all over Scripture. In order to live, you have to die to self. You have to die to self. Deny self. No longer I who live. Remember, remember, why did this revival break out? Because the church in Korea was desperate for God. They saw their country struggling. They saw their churches struggling. They said, we need to come together and cry out for God's help. They were praying and pleading before God, and he answered. And this has been the story of the church in South Korea ever since. It is a story of prayerful desperation for God. Every morning, and when I was there, every morning, the church I was preaching in, they were gathering at 5.30 to pray. Every morning. They have all night prayer meetings. Most Christians in this room, I would venture, have never been to an all night prayer meeting. Some of them have one every Friday night. I remember a professor of mine in seminary telling a story about having preached over in South Korea. He was staying in his hotel, and he woke up really early one morning, like four o'clock in the morning, to a loud sound outside. It was still dark, so he got up, went over to the window, opened it, and he saw a stadium full of people across the way, and that's where the sound was coming from. There was this roar coming from the stadium, and he thought, what kind of sports do they play? 4 a.m. in South Korea. He was frustrated. Like, this is absurd. So he closed the window, tried to go back to sleep, couldn't. Finally, later in the morning, got up. When it was time to come down, he goes to the lobby, and he just asked the receptionist, 
what sporting event was going on at 4 o'clock this morning in the stadium over there? And the receptionist said, oh, sir, that was not a sporting event. That was the church praying to God. The roar of Christians from a stadium crying out to God at 4 in the morning. We have all kinds of roars from stadiums around here. But it is for that which is in this world. And God, teach us to pray like this. And teach me to pray like this. And I can picture it. So each message after I would preach, one of the pastors would come up, and God was, well, I don't know. I'm not there all the time. Uh, but God was moving and uh, some powerful ways and uh, so the pastor would come up and he would lead in a time of prayer so the 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 word for and for korean brothers and sisters in this room i'm about to butcher the korean language so please apologize or please accept my apology from the very beginning but the word for lord uh sounds a lot like chuyo uh, so I know I'm not, so chuyo. So what would happen is the pastor would come up after I've, we've walked through the word, the pastor would come up and say, we're going to pray. And all of a sudden, everybody across the room in unison would yell, chuyo! And then they would go for it. All at the same time, crying out to God. Not like our, like, uh, if we're praying all at the same time, we got like a, a whisper hum, like, a, like we're at a golf event. Like this was, this was more... Uh, Stadium like. Chuyo, and they just start crying out to God. I'm looking around the room, and people in tears, people crying out to God, just praising Him, thanking Him, pleading for mercy, interceding in all kinds of different ways, and they would just go on and on and on like this. It was awesome. Like, brothers and sisters, we need to learn to pray. So, uh, I came back two, two, two Fridays ago, we just had our first all night prayer meeting. And that's the first one I'd ever been a part of in a church. It was awesome. It was awesome. I, I, I distinctly remember as, as I was going through it, I remember when I was a kid uh, seeing my uh, family go to a, a Wednesday night prayer meeting when I went to Wednesday night activities, and they would go to prayer meeting. And one time I just asked, like, what do you do for an hour? And they were like, we pray. And I just remember walking away. I remember thinking, that sounds so boring. I praise God for how he has, like, transformed my spiritual taste buds. Like, it was, it was awesome. And uh, I just was thinking, why, why have I not led churches I've pastored to do this before? And we have so much farther to go. We're trying to grow in all these. I, I don't know what this needs to look like, but I do know we spend hours doing all sorts of stuff in the church and relative minutes in prayer. And that's got to change. I'm guessing there's hours and hours and hours spent in all of our lives and ministries and work and school and church, doing all kinds of stuff and relative minutes in prayer, got to help this to change. Because think about what is prayer? Prayer is death to self. If we don't pray, we're basically saying to God, we can do this without you. But we can't. We can't. We need God. And we realize, right, prayer at its root, prayerlessness at its root is pride. Prayerlessness at its root is pride. It is an attitude of a heart that says, I can do this without God. And it is utter foolishness. And it is, I fear, too much a part of our church culture, I'll just say, my life and ministry. It needs to change. Like, we can't do this without God. We need God. We need God in our lives. We need God in our, our marriages, our parenting. Our kids, our teenagers need God. Our churches need the grace of God. Our country needs the grace of God. Don't we? We have plenty of reason to pray. If we believe we need God, then we will pray, like really pray, like cry out to God with passion because we can't go on without him. God, help us to die to ourselves in these ways. In order to live, you have to die to self. What will it take? God, to bring us to a death to sin and a death to self. And then, third, in order to live, 
In order to live, you have to die to the ways of this world. You have to hate your life in this world, Jesus says. Which again means hate the kind of life that is caught up in the ways, the pursuits and the pleasures and the possessions and the priorities of this world. In order to really live, you have to die to these things. And I saw that kind of death in South Korea, literally. So the day before I left, I was standing in a cemetery that the Korean church has preserved. It's a really powerful picture. The Korean church there has preserved a cemetery as a monument to missionaries who came and died there. Missionaries who died to the pursuits, pleasures, possessions, priorities of this world, who did what looked like foolishness to the world, and move to an unknown country to learn an unknown language and live in a difficult place where you have to die daily to the ways of this world. That cemetery is full of missionaries and their families, like little kids, one month old, one month old six months old, who died of dysentery or other diseases. Wives who died and husbands carried on the work. Husbands who died and the wives carried on the work. Dying typhoid, other illnesses. One of the tombstones was Homer Holbert. He was a diplomat from England. Been pretty successful in the world, but he got a heart for Korea. Ended up spending his life for the Korean people there. There's a quote from him over the grave. It says, I would rather be buried in Korea than in Westminster Abbey. That's a perspective on the ways of this world. The cemetery was filled with students who came there when they were in their early 20s, many from the student volunteer movement. Gave 40 years of their lives in Korea. And not just students. Mary Scranton was 52 when she decided to come to Korea. Started a school for girls, worked to share the gospel with women, spent, with women, spent her last 24 years in Korea until she died at age 76. And it wasn't just the missionaries, but those who supported them. So follow this. The Underwood family had four generations represented in that cemetery. Four generations of their family had served for the spread of the gospel in Korea. Do you know how their work there was financed? So back in the early 20th century, there was something called the Underwood Typewriter. John Underwood produced the first successful modern typewriter just before the turn of the century, and by 1939, he'd produced five million of them. So picture the Steve Jobs, the Apple, MacBook, and this brother used his revenue to support his family spreading the gospel in Korea. So the world would say to these men and women, what are you doing? Giving up everything and going to Korea with no comforts, where you're dying of diseases. Do you hate your life? And they would say, yes, in a sense. But in reality, they were finding life. They were giving life and yielding fruit that they never could have imagined. I, can, I just, I couldn't help but to send out some messages, stand in that cemetery to brothers and sisters around the world who are serving in hard places and don't underestimate the fruit, the fruit that God will use in your death far after you are gone. And it wasn't just missionaries from the West who were dying in the ways of this world. It was our brothers and sisters in the East. So I mentioned uh, Japanese occupation of Korea in the early 20th century, only to be followed by communism after that in the North, both of which wreaked havoc on the church. So one of the main issues during Japanese occupation was shrine worship. Japan set up shrines and required Korean citizens to bow down before them. Some Christians and pastors justified bowing down to them as an act, it's just an act of patriotism, but many refused and it cost them. Kids were kicked out of schools, parents lost jobs with it, the ability to support their families, Many were thrown into prison, nurses, farmers, pregnant mothers, teenage students. One young pastor of a large church, Chu Kachul, was arrested in 1938. He was in prison for six months, then questioned and released. As soon as he was, he stepped back into the pulpit at his church and went right back to preaching that bowing at the feet of shrines was idolatry. An undercover detective was in the congregation and he was arrested again. His young children, crying as they took him away. His congregation met every morning at 5 a.m., even in bitter cold months, to pray that God would help their pastor to stand strong. 
In the days to come, he was flogged and tortured many times as his captors tried to persuade him to bow, but he never gave in. He withered in prison for the next six years until his body was wasted away, and he said to his wife, quote, I've gone the road I was supposed to go. Follow my steps. We'll meet in heaven. One of Chu's sons went on to follow in his dad's footsteps as an evangelist, crossed North Korea before he, too, was martyred. I was struck when I read this from one writer. He said, I've never met that son, but the crop of keen, consecrated young men, able in God's word, now serving in churches throughout South Korea, who came from that young evangelist church during the time of his ministry, is exceptional. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Kim Yoon Sup was arrested a total of 10 different times. Every time they would torture him, it stretches back out on a bench with his hands tied underneath his head, hanging over the edge where they would pour water from a kettle down his nostrils to simulate drowning him, sometimes adding red pepper to increase the pain. They branded him with a hot iron. They would use the back of a chair as a fulcrum to try to bend his body backward to simulate bowing to a shrine, but he would fight kicking and screaming when they realized they couldn't beat him into submission. They decided they'd release him for a short time, let him taste freedom of life with his family, wife and kids, and his church. When he would refuse to bow, they'd arrest him again, yank him away from his four-year-old son crying uncontrollably. Before his 10th arrest and eventual death in prison, Kim was asked, how do you have the courage to keep going in the face of constant arrests? And he replied, when I became a Christian, I died with Christ. And once you are dead, what men do to you cannot hurt you. With the end of Japanese occupation came the onslaught of communism, which unfortunately would prove far more brutal than anything the Japanese had done. Mass tortures, executions of Christians. At one point, the People's Police ordered about 180 church members to come to their church building for a meeting. When they arrived, they were locked inside. The wooden church building was set on fire with a communist officers standing outside to shoot anyone who tried to escape. These Christians, knowing they were going to die no matter what they did, started singing in worship until the burning building collapsed over them and they were consumed in the fire. One, one last story that sums up both periods of persecution. Sun Yang Wan was a pastor in a leper colony, refused to worship shrines during Japanese occupation, was arrested and imprisoned, and then released when Japanese occupation ended. But then during communist rule, his two oldest sons, Tongan and Tongson, were off at middle school, doing well with hopes of moving on to a university in America. One day, though, in a communist revolt, a mob of students representing the Communist Party, came onto the campus. Knowing these two boys were strong Christians, they brought them out, started to beat them. And eventually, a student named An, the leader of the mob, shot and killed both boys. News came back to Pastor Soon, who heard that the revolt had been quieted and heard that the killer had been apprehended. Pastor Soon immediately sent a messenger to the court to plead for them to spare that student's life. And Pastor Soon went so far as to offer to adopt him as his own son. The judge, totally shocked, agreed. And Pastor Soon adopted his son's killer. Years later, when communists invaded the leper colony, he'd gone back to pastor. He refused to flee, instead staying with that church. He was arrested, imprisoned, tied up with 75 others, and executed where his adopted son, An, wept over his body. John 12 doesn't make sense if this life, if this world is all there is. If life is all about the possessions and pleasures and pursuits of this world, then these brothers and sisters totally missed it. They should have lived it up in this world. But they didn't miss it. We're the ones who are tempted to miss it. I guarantee you, every single one of these brothers and sisters, missionaries and martyrs alike, doesn't regret for a second hating their lives in this world. What does Jesus say in verse 26? If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Let me tell you where all of those brothers and sisters are right now. They are where Jesus is, and the Father is honoring them. And they don't regret for a second hating their lives in this world. They know life. 
like real life, eternal life. I'm walking through that cemetery just thinking, I cannot wait to meet these people. They died in the ways of this world, and others are following in their footsteps. Martyrs and missionaries alike, like I stood uh, one day on the border of North Korea, looking over to that country, realizing we have, we have brothers and family on the other side of those mountains right now in labor camps, languishing in prison because they're followers of Jesus. They've died to the ways of this world. And missionaries as well. I mentioned South Korea has become the second largest sending country for missionaries in the world behind the U.S., and though they're much smaller than the U.S., the founding pastor, so follow this, do the math, the founding pastor of the church where I was preaching, Pastor Ha, in 1993, when the church had 3,000 members, he challenged the church to send out 2,000 missionaries. Like missionaries, like people who move somewhere else in the world for the spread of the gospel. Not like on a short-term mission trip, like move. 3,000 members, 2,000 missionaries. And this last year, 25 years later, they had done it. They've sent out 2,000 missionaries. They have close to 1,000 on the field right now. One church, granted it's a large church, but they have over a quarter of the number of missionaries that 40,000 Southern Baptist churches have on the field right now. Just think about that goal. 3,000 members, we're going to send out 2,000 missionaries. Take your church size right now, whatever size it is, and then think about sending two-thirds of that number as missionaries moving somewhere else for the spread of the gospel. 100 people in your church, your goal, 67 missionaries moving for the spread of the gospel. How is that possible? Here's how. You die. How is fruit like that possible? A church dies to sin, and a church dies to self, and a church dies to the ways of this world and lives for what's going to matter far beyond this world. And it all starts with a pastor, with leaders in a church who die to sin, and who die to self, and who die to the ways of this world. So brothers and sisters across this campus, I challenge us today as leaders in the church, based on the history of our brothers and sisters in South Korea, more important, based on basic Christianity in the words of John 12. Let's die. Let's die to our sin. Let's hate our sin in this world. Let's ask God to break us over sin in this world, to weep over it, to run from it, to repent of it. Let's die to our sin. Let's die to ourselves. Let's pray. Let's start to pray like we believe we need God, like we want God. Let's cry out for his mercy and grace and his power and his presence. Let's ask God to move in our lives and our families and our cities and the world and our country in a way that can only be explained by his hand. Let's die to our sin. Let's die to ourselves and let's die to the ways of this world. We are not living for this world. Living for another world. Let's a grain of wheat falls near the dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Don't you want to bear fruit? Don't we want to bear fruit from our lives and our families and our churches? Don't we, we, don't we want to see fruit for God's glory here around the world? Like South Korea from 1% Christian to 10 million followers of Christ? Just imagine. I, I hear even sentiment today, like our country's so far gone, there's no hope for us. That is not true. But let it be clear that hope is not another election, any leader. Our hope is in our God. And he alone is able to move in mighty ways if we will cry out to him in faith. And not just here. God is able to do in other countries what he did in South Korea. Just think of a country that today is less than 1% Christian. Afghanistan. Yemen. Is it possible to see 10 million followers of Jesus in Afghanistan 100 years from now? In Yemen, sending out missionaries around the world from Afghanistan or Yemen? Absolutely, that's possible. When a seed dies, it bears not just fruit, it bears much fruit. So believe this. What fruit does God want to bear through our lives when we die? Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me where I am. There will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. These are hard words, but they are glorious words. It's hard to die to sin and die to self and die to the ways of this world, but it's worth it. Brothers and sisters, to gain eternal life, to bear fruit, not just in our lives, but far beyond our lives and others experiencing life, and in it all to receive the honor of God, I long for that not just to be the story of the church in South Korea. I long for that to be the story of the churches we lead. We pray with them.
Uh, oh God, I. Uh, pray that you would help me. You would help us to, to die to sin and to die to ourselves and to die to the ways of this world and to live. We want to live. And we want to bear fruit. We want to bear much fruit for your glory and for others good and for our joy so help us to die we pray in all these ways in Jesus name amen